It is 24 past three. If anybody else is going to uh, book their seat early uh, to get to the grand final next year, give us a call and tell us what sort of prices you are being quoted and whether or not you may have to sell the house in order to fly across for the grand final. In the meantime, let's talk coal. Uh, Terry Barnes, a former advisor to Tony Abbott in the Howard government, has written an interesting piece on the, on the drum. Uh, he's making the case for coal, which is not always an easy thing to do these days. A lot of... It's a fashion to to attack coal and say it's all going to be, you know, alternative energy and so forth. But you know, there's a lot of money being invested in coal mines still, and it's still a a major source of energy around the world. Let's have a chat to Terry. Good afternoon. Hello, Adam. Yes, just outline your argument here, Terry, if you could. Well, basically, the Minister for Resources and Energy, Josh Frydenberg, who's just been sworn in, has basic has gone and said, look, we need to export our coal. Our Australian coal is good, high-quality, clean coal that uh, actually helps uh, relieve poverty in the third world because, it's one, it's cheap, two, it's easily accessible, three, it doesn't have the dangerous uh, chemicals and other byproducts that uh, other forms of energy have, like uh, wood stoves and uh, burning dung, for instance, in, in household heaters. So mm. he's basically saying that uh, if we've got millions and even billions of people off the electricity grid, you want to get them on it, that's a good thing. So coal helps with that. But he also says when we're te- dealing with people who are struggling with poverty and, and the consequences of poverty, including ill health, uh, clean energy of any sort, and including coal, is actually a good thing. And that's really taking it up to the environmental and the conservation lobby who basically say that coal is evil and should stay in the ground. Yes. Yes, you made the point that uh, we've had 61 well-known Australians have signed this open letter, which went to the Fairfax uh, Press calling for the Paris Climate Summit in December to place a moratorium on the mining of coal. What would that do to our economy in terms of jobs and growth and so forth if that were to happen? Well, if, it's, if coal stopped tomorrow, uh, the economy wouldn't uh, wouldn't judder to a halt, but it would certainly slow down. I mean, many thousands of jobs depend on coal mining, on coal export, and, of course, in the power generation industry. So we don't want to stop that. And as for those 61 eminent Australians, of whom quite a number were actors who were long forgotten back in the 1960s, I noticed, uh, uh, they need to think about the the real consequences of, you know, they're, they're holier than they are feel, feel good uh, uh, sort of feelings because... Uh, Really, when it comes to the real world out there, not just in Australia and our economy and our jobs, but uh, in the third world as well, where a lot of uh, this coal, including the Adani coal mine coal that's being proposed in Queensland, mm. uh, there are a lot of people who would lose out if basically the, the, the goody, goodies had their way. Because it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's hard to get this kind of message across these days. The balance has gone out of the argument. Basically, if you're, if you're seen to be pro-coal, it's tantamount to, I don't know, bashing baby heart seals on the head or, you know, or, or whatever. It's, you know, it just seems <laughs> to be, you, you, you don't have a balanced argument going on here. Well, that's right. And, and I think what Frydenberg is doing, which I actually approve, and it's good to see that, uh, you know, whether it's a change of leadership or not, that uh, ministers are getting out there and arguing their case in terms of it's good is uh, saying to the uh, established conservation lobby who basically don't like being challenged and uh, come down on you like a ton of bricks if you do, that mm. uh, he's prepared to take the fight up to them and actually have a debate. And if they, they instead of basically knocking him on the head and calling him deranged, which uh, one Green senator did, they need to actually say why he is wrong. We need a real debate. And then Frydenberg, to his great credit, and Turnbull, Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister, allowing him to do it, I think it deserves full credit. Mm. As you say, these anti-coal activists resent their moral positions being questioned at all. Now, that's not how to, how to have a debate, is it? No, no. I think a debate needs two sides and being yeah. prepared to say, look, you may be right on this, but wrong on that. And, uh, and fortunately, when it comes to the green debate and the environmental issues generally that we deal with, um, including climate change and global warming, if you actually dare suggest that uh, um, the greenies are wrong, then basically it comes back at you in full force. And that's yeah. not really the way that things should be done. I guess most of us in the middle here, Terry, uh, are saying, well, what about a bit of balance? I mean, we've got fantastic, uh, you know, renewable energy here, sun and wind and so forth. Thank, thank goodness we've we'll got all the skin cancer. We might as well get some solar out of it as well. Um, you know, why can't we have a... It seems to be a polarised debate as opposed to saying, well... You know, there will be coal there, there will be wind, there will be uh, solar and so forth. This has to be, as I say, a polarised kind of de- a debate. 
Well, that's right. And, and we shouldn't be saying that coal is the only answer. We should be looking at uh, solar. We should be looking at wind. We should be also looking at nuclear energy, as I think the new chief scientist, Alan Finkel, said the other day. Um, it's not just any one form that is right, but... Mm. Uh, if we are going to get rid of dirty energy, including dirty coal for that matter, we have to uh, look at the broad mix and that includes clean coal. Let's, let's just, just get honest and get on with it. Indeed. Now, now speaking of wind, uh, your former boss, Tony Abbott, was giving a speech there in, in London, the, the, the Maggie Thatcher address there in London, and he sort of, he tried to uh, suggest that uh, our success in stopping the boats, the techniques could be used in Europe, which I found a bit of a stretch to actually accept that, that uh, here is Australia surrounded by this massive moat called Several Oceans and that we could, use, we could use the same techniques in Europe where we have people crossing land, there's small areas of water and so forth. And I thought the, the argument was a bit weird, to be honest. Terry, what did you think? Well, look, I, I think if I was advising Tony Abbott uh, today, I would have advised him not to make uh, that the centrepiece of his speech. But having said that, um, he made a very fair point, which is that uh, um, the best way to deal with these uh, great moral problems, and they are great moral problems, is to cut the cut the trade in people off at its source, and that is uh, what we've effectively done very successfully here. But as you say, we are surrounded by very wide oceans, whereas the Mediterranean Sea is actually uh, relatively narrow for uh, mm. refugees or asylum seekers to cross. But having said that, he made another point, which I think is very important, and that is that uh, if you don't deal effectively with this great, great, great flow of people, um, Europe itself is going to change uh, totally in one way or another in the future because uh, uh, the, the mix of people, uh, the, the, what uh, European governments are, are trying to struggle with uh, is, is basically... Uh, being swamped with a wave of humanity that has not been seen since the end of the Second World War and, and really uh, European governments and, and basically governments around the world have not worked out how to cope with that. Well, that's true, but, uh, but, uh, but I guess that sort of uh, that highlights a kind of mu- a museum view of culture and things. And I would have thought that, uh, you know, that Europe has been conquered and, and conquered and, and subjugated and over, over millennia. It's always changed. We'll never, we, Europe will never stay still, and this is another example of it. There's a lot of people need, needing to find a home. Well, it's one thing to have a melting pot, Adam, and I think uh, I fully agree with what you say. I mean, uh, Europe today has been formed by waves of migration from over thousands of years. Mm. But uh, when you have a melting pot, and uh, you need to make sure that you control the temperature as best you can. And uh, that's where Europe is actually really struggling at the moment. But uh, we but we can't be heartless. And I, I, the thing that worried me about Tony Abbott's speech is the impression that he was being heartless when I know that he wasn't. Um, I think he said in the speech that this may ignore our consciences sometimes. And uh, I think it, uh, the whole issue should ignore at everybody's conscience. Well, but don't we, shouldn't we listen to our conscience as well, though? That's why I, I, I really lit on that, on that phrase and thought, gee, why wouldn't you listen to your conscience if you know it's wrong? Well, I don't... In the Australian context, I don't think it is wrong. I mean, that was the point he was making. But in terms of what's going on in Europe and the, the sheer volume of people that they're dealing with compared to what we've been coping with, mm. uh, it's clear that... Uh, Simply doing what we do here is probably not the way to go. But on the other hand, getting the balance right between allowing that migration to happen and dealing with uh, the consequences of great uh, masses of people knocking in the door or knocking yeah. down the door at the one time is something that uh, I don't think we're as qualified to give advice on as uh, some may think. No, indeed. Um, so do you think he's going to go quietly, uh, Tony, or you think he's going to stay on the back bench there and maybe wait for another opportunity? I've asked you this before, I think, last um, time we spoke. Yes, look, I think uh, if I was advising Tony Abbott uh, again, I would uh, suggest that uh, there is a public life beyond Parliament for him, uh, but not until the next election. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, You don't want a situation where he sits on the back bench like Banquo's ghost in Macbeth, you know, uh, basically always reminding people about what they did, because uh, it might be okay for, for a year or two, but... Uh, if it went on longer than that, uh, I think his colleagues would actually turn on him, and I don't think that's uh, yeah. fair to either him or his legacy. But on the other hand, uh, it's up to the new Prime Minister to prove that uh, he's uh, you know, basically deserved uh, the job that he put his hand up and uh, yeah. took from Tony Abbott. And I don't think at this stage that he has actually proved that he is, uh, he is the man yet. He's talking. Do you look talk. at the polls, though, Terry? The polls are going his but, way? 
Well, as I, I said to somebody else recently, uh, even Alexander Downer had honeymoon. So you've got to actually keep it in, all in context. But my having said that, I, I have to be honest. I think he's made a reasonable start, but he has to keep doing it. Yeah. To deliver. But so, also, if the reports are right that Tony Abbott's going to get $40,000 per speech, I'd say, what are you doing sitting on the back bench? You should be out talking your head off. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. listen, I could get if I can get $40,000 a speech, I'd be very happy. But um, the thing is that uh, his primary duty while he's a member of parliament is to be a member of parliament uh, and not to be, uh, um, as uh, I think the Australian likes to call Kevin Rudd, a holy Roman Empire, emperor. Um, yeah. He he needs to, to think about his constituents and serve them until such time as he retires. Yeah. But in my sense, he could uh, make a great contribution to public life beyond parliament and... Uh, and frankly, I don't think that the parliamentary party would go back to him for whatever reason. I think there are some very bright, young, talented uh, uh, members coming through, including, as I think I've said to you before, your own Christian Porter. Indeed, he's waiting in the wings. I, I hope that Tony is still taking your advice and because uh, he'll be fine. Thank you for your time, Terry, as always. That's uh, Terry Barnes, former Tony Abbott advisor whilst he was in the Howard government as a health minister. Interesting argument, Cole, though. I think it's become a very, as I say, very polarised argument and uh, we have to have an integrated future. Clearly there's, there's alternatives, the energy plus the traditional stuff. We have plenty of coal. There'd be thousands of jobs lost if we were just to suddenly call a moratorium tomorrow. Give us a call with your views, 922 